Hey Star Trek fans, Dan Gunther here once again with a Star Trek Picard deep dive episode. This week we are taking a look at Season 3, Episode 5, Imposters. We're halfway through the season, so let's take a look at the Easter eggs and canon connections in this episode. And of course, as always, warning for spoilers. Let's take a look. The episode starts with this sort of waking nightmare experienced by Jack Crusher. In it, he seems to kill the bridge crew of the USS Titan with this, this kind of old school looking phaser, which has many similarities to the classic phaser seen in Star Trek, the original series. We learn from Seven of Nine that since the end of the Dominion War, every person boarding a Federation starship must pass through an internal imaging chamber to verify that they are not in fact a changeling. The Dominion War was of course chronicled in the final two seasons of Star Trek Deep Space Nine and was a quadrants spanning conflict that involved the United Federation of Planets, the Dominion, the Klingon and Romulan empires, and many more Alpha and Beta quadrant forces. The leaders of the Dominion were the changeling changelings or the founders, Odo's people, shapeshifters who are once again the main antagonist for this season of Picard. Tests against changeling infiltration included phaser sweeps and blood screenings, the latter of which we see in this episode. However, it seems that these precautions are no longer effective and changelings are now able to evade those through some sort of advanced form of humanoid mimicry. I found this line from Picard very interesting when he tells Jack Crusher that Many a rebel from all reaches of the galaxy have found their way to Starfleet. I love this line in the context of the character we will meet later in the episode, of course, namely Ro Laren, who is in fact a rebel who found her way to Starfleet apparently twice. In what has become a fairly prevalent trope this season, we see Worf and Raffi sparring with the Klingon theme making itself known during the match. Once again, we get a Starfleet Intelligence Associates list, and there are a few Easter eggs in this one listing Sneed's associates. First of all, we have Laurel of Renhia. Laurel was actually featured in the Deep Space Nine episode Who Mourns for Morn, this character here who was an associate of Morn, who is of course also listed amongst Sneed's associates, Morn of Luria here, as well as Brunt of Ferenginar and Thadian Akona as well, both characters that have appeared in prior Star Trek Brunt in several episodes of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, and Okana in Star Trek The Next Generation Season 2 episode The Outrageous Okana, as well as a few episodes of Star Trek Prodigy. When Worf and Raffi make their presence known in Metallus Prime's District 6, we can see this on Raffi's shoulder. This would appear to be a mobile holographic emitter first seen in Star Trek Voyager as 29th century technology that the Doctor was able to acquire and leave the confines of sickbay. This of course is explicitly revealed to the audience later when the Vulcan crime boss, Kryn, destroys it, ending the Raffi hologram ruse. We see a new Federation starship in this episode, the USS Intrepid, Duderstadt class, NCC 79520. I really like this design. It's reminiscent of a few different designs from Star Trek history, as well as the class name, Duderstadt. We have learned from Doug Drexler that this is in fact an homage to his late wife, Dorothy Duder, who worked on Star Trek Enterprise and recently passed away. We get this killer scene between Captain Shaw, Riker, and Picard in the turbo lift on the Titan when Shaw references a number of adventures of the crew of the Enterprise D and E. First of all, he mentions Riker hot dropping the saucer section of the Enterprise D on a planet. This, of course, is a reference to Star Trek Generations when the Enterprise D saucer section crash landed on Viridian 3. He also mentions that Picard threw the Prime Directive out the window so he could snog a villager on Baku. This is a reference to Picard's relationship with Anish, played by Donna Murphy in the film Star Trek Insurrection. And finally, he says, or the time you boys nearly wiped out all of humanity by creating a time paradox in the Devron system. This is a reference to the final episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, All Good Things, in which an anti-time anomaly was created in the Devron system, bringing together past, present, and future. Now, this is a particularly interesting reference because no one 
one else remembers these events except Jean-Luc Picard. Captain Blog Supplemental. Starfleet Command reports no unusual activity along the neutral zone, and there is no sign of a temporal anomaly. It would appear that I am the only member of the crew to retain any knowledge of the events I experienced. So Starfleet would have to rely on his reporting of the events and believe him in order for that to be entered into the official record. And of course, being that he is Jean-Luc Picard, they did, of course, believe him. And I love that this is Picard's self-reporting on something that was done. And now it's coming back to bite him with Shaw referring to it as a reason why Starfleet might not exactly hold Riker and Picard in the highest of esteems. Now let's come to what I think of as the heart of this episode and something that I was really, really happy to see. The return of Ro Laren, played by the amazing Michelle Forbes. Ro is a character who I have always loved. I think she brought a great deal of really interesting things to Star Trek The Next Generation. And I never really imagined that we'd see her again in canon Star Trek. And yet here she is. Very, very happy for this. There are several references to the last time we saw her in Canon Trek, which was the penultimate TNG episode, Preemptive Strike, in which Ro left Starfleet and joined the Maquis, betraying Captain Picard. She was on an undercover mission to infiltrate the Maquis at the time. And in fact, direct references made to the episode when Picard reminds Riker that the last time he saw Ro, she pulled a phaser on him. However, in that episode, as here, Riker understands where Roe is coming from and is kind of forgiving towards her and even tells Picard at the end of that episode that her only real regret was betraying you. That betrayal, however, is palpable. We see it on Picard's face in that episode and now it's had 30 years to marinate. So this reunion is, for lack of a better term, frosty to say the least. Going back to Worf and Raffi, we meet Kryn, this Vulcan mob boss that I mentioned earlier. Very interesting character, played expertly by Kirk Acevedo. A uh, wonderful actor. We've seen him before in Fringe and 12 Monkeys. Very fascinating character here. He's got a huge Vulcan Idic symbol that he wears around his neck. Idic standing for infinite diversity in infinite combination. A tenet of Vulcan beliefs. We also see Vulcan writing tattooed on his face. And I love his justification for being a crime boss saying that you cannot have a utopia without crime. Therefore, organized criminal element is logical. However, we also see that he is definitely unbalanced in many respects, reacting very emotionally and not as a typical Vulcan would. Kryn forces Worf and Raffi to fight to the death, the result of which is the seeming death of Worf at Raffi's hand. However, as Worf explains to Kryn, he has mastered the Kalis technique of regulating his heart rate. Kalis, of course, is the Klingon messiah, the person who united the Empire under his banner thousands of years ago and is considered a divine figure in Klingon philosophy and belief. And apparently he was also good at regulating his heart rate. At the end of the fight, Worf says, Today was a good day to die, referencing the commonly said phrase by the Klingons, Today is a good day to die. We've heard that many times since that phrase was first tied to the Klingons in TNG. Going back to the Titan now, we have Picard and Roe entering the 10 forward simulation. Picard offering Roe Bajoran spring wine, which is a beverage that has been mentioned many times before, mostly in Star Trek Deep Space Nine, as a favored libation of the Bajorans. We see Picard reach below the bar and turn off the safety protocols on the holodeck in very easily accessed and used controls for something so dangerous, I might add. And this ties even more closely into that Easter egg from the closing credits where we see the 10 forward holodeck simulation and flashing at the bottom safety protocols off. Now, this scene between Picard and Roe is wonderfully acted. Two master actors here. Michelle Forbes stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with Sir Patrick Stewart, and they both turn in an incredible performance here. Honestly, the way they've been kind of 
manipulating us throughout the episode, making us wonder, is Ro a changeling? Is this actually Ro Laren? In this scene, that comes to a culmination here when we know for sure that Ro is actually herself. And we know that Ro believes that Picard is himself as well. Through this scene, with the climax coming when Picard tells Ro, you broke my heart. And she replies back, and you broke mine. Just an incredible scene. I love these two characters. I love these two actors. So much going on here that serves the plot so well, but also ties up some great loose ends from 30 years prior. Wonderful stuff. Also name dropped in this scene once again is Admiral Janeway. She's been getting a lot of name drops this season and it's really making me wonder if we will see the Admiral at some point during this series. We get a glimpse of Daystrom Station here, and it would appear to be based upon the design of Jupiter Station, first seen in the Voyager episode Lifeline, as well as the Midas Array, which was seen in the Voyager episode Pathfinder. It's nice to see these classic designs being used in this new era of Star Trek. So many things seem to be kind of brand new. It's nice to see things tying it back to the classic 90s era Star Trek. At the end of the episode, Titan is on the run, and this gave me vibes of Star Trek Discovery Season 2 when the Discovery went on the run at the end of the episode, If Memory Serves. Once again, the ship is kind of on its own, going up against a bad element that's wormed its way into Starfleet. It's almost becoming a trope at this point, but one that I'm really fascinated to see play out, especially given Shaw as the captain and how he's going to be able to deal with being against Starfleet when he's been so by the books up to this point. So I'm really excited to see where that aspect of the storyline goes. Now, of course, the big thing at the end of this episode that I'm not exactly happy with is the death of Ro Laren. This is a character who, first of all, I have to say I'm really excited to see back. I never thought we'd get her again in canon, so I am very grateful to see the character here. However, this new era of Star Trek and Star Trek Picard in particular has kind of made a point of killing off legacy characters. So far in Star Trek Picard, we've lost Hugh, Icheb, Q and now Ro Laren, and that makes me really sad. I'm still extremely angry about Hugh's death in season one of Picard, and at least Ro's sacrifice here serves a bit more of a narrative purpose and is a bit more meaningful than Hugh's death was in that episode, but it still hurts to lose these legacy characters like this, and I'm very sad to see Ro go. Well, those were all of the Easter eggs and canon connections that I was able to find. Were there any that I missed? Please let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. And now that we're halfway through Picard season three, really excited to see what's going to happen in the back half of the season. So thank you all who have stuck with me and subscribed through the season. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of really cool stuff to take a look at in the rest of the season, as well as the upcoming Star Trek shows beyond the end of Picard season three. So please subscribe if you haven't already. To those of you who are already subscribed, thank you so very much. And those of you who aren't, thank you just for watching the video. I do appreciate that but a special thanks and shout out to the patreon supporters of the channel i could not do it without you thank you so very much i'll see you all in the next video until then as always live long and prosper